All right, I think we, we're gonna get started, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Artur Krasinski, and uh, please join me in welcoming on the stage our guest, Max Levchin. Amazing guy uh, who is like the uh, CEO of the Affirm right now, but of course, many of you can, uh, can know him because uh, he was co-founder and CTO of, of PayPal. And uh, okay. Welcome to Poland. We we have this conversation uh, just before entering the stage, and you said that it's your first time in Europe. I mean, like giving this kind of speech. That's true. Um, it's my first time in Europe, continental Europe, since the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, and my first time, first real time in Poland. I've been in Poland very briefly 30 years ago, last time. Uh, but now I'm back for more than more than 10 minutes. I used to do a lot of these university talks until the pandemic began, and this is the first time I've done it since. Also, I mean, like, uh, let's start with the Affirm, because it is your last endeavor. Uh, can you explain to us what is Affirm, what you guys are doing? The basic idea for Affirm was that financial services can be done in a more honest way. I think the stereotype that exists worldwide that financial services are basically a deal between you and the bank where the bank is betting that you will screw up and that's how they make money okay. is actually not okay as a status quo. And I think we've lived in that status quo for maybe hundreds of years, but certainly in the last 50 years. And so when we started the company, I thought, well, maybe it's possible to build a financial services company that is actually good. I would argue that with PayPal, we started that work and built a company that was neutral. So PayPal does not have necessarily its users' best interest in mind, but it's not actively trying to screw them. With a firm, we thought, let's build something where we're actively trying to make the user's lives better. And so we started it almost, 12, uh, almost 12 years ago asking the question, how can we build a better credit score, which came from my own experience. So I grew up in Ukraine, moved to the US as a teenager, had no credit, had no credit score, ended up screwing up my credit, having a very bad credit score, and took a long time to fix it and recover. And so on the strength of that memory, I thought, I'll build a better credit score, the one that helps immigrants and students and sort of people like me 30 years ago. And eventually, we ended up doing what is now known as buy now, pay later. But I would argue that we sort of, we did it before it had a name. But the idea was, what if we lent money, but instead of making it confusing, we'd make it easy. Instead of overcharging, we would actually disclose everything we could possibly ever charge you and then made it less instead of more over time, where credit cards would do things like revolving credit. We would make it simple. So we would tell you, here's exactly how many dollars you will ever pay and not a penny more, and so on and so forth. So we built basically a borrowing product that was healthier for the end borrower. Um, one of the things that I wrote down when we started the company was this idea that credit used to be such a good word and debt is such a bad one. And yet now, most people that borrow money don't think they're getting credit, they think they're getting into debt. And so what if we fixed the meaning of the word credit and brought it back to what it means to be? So we started by creating a new credit score, then we built a new way to borrow that was more, much more pro-consumer. And then we figured out how to bring it to the consumer by embedding it at the point of sale. And so today, there's a giant industry worldwide called Buy Now, Pay Later. We were one of the very first companies doing it. There's obviously European competitors, Australian competitors. Every country now has their own Buy Now, Pay Later leader. We were kind of there first, but uh, it doesn't really matter. But that, that's what Affirm does. But Affirm is a uh, kind of next company, I mean, like the, uh, the first one, the, the PayPal. Um, that was the, the fintech company. Uh, can you tell us more about how do you how do you come up with the idea of PayPal? Um, idea for PayPal was actually 
not at all a fintech idea. <laughs> so the, the, the difference between PayPal and Affirm is that with Affirm, I knew exactly what I wanted to build. I started the company I wanted to create, and for the last almost 12 years, I didn't have to change the plans at all. With PayPal, I was just out of school. My specialty, I majored in computer science, but I specialized in cryptography. Before cryptocurrencies were a thing, crypto used to mean something else. Um, but uh, I, 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 I wanted to break secret codes, but I was not a citizen of anything because I left Soviet Union and I didn't have a Soviet passport anymore because the country didn't exist. And uh, I hadn't yet gotten my American passport. And so as a result, I couldn't get a job working for the United States government, breaking codes. <laughs> and so instead, I moved to California and was trying to start a company to maybe break codes, maybe make codes. And so the original idea for PayPal was not called PayPal. It was something else entirely. The idea was, let's build secret codes for really, really small computers. So the idea of a pocket computer, Palm Pilot, was just starting. And I thought, oh, no one who makes Palm Pilots understands anything about cryptography. That's my opening. I'm going to go make a company that does both. And uh, no one cared. It didn't work at all. <laughs> uh, and then we had five other ideas, literally, and no one cared. And then the very last idea, you know the joke where you always find the thing you lost in the last place you look. So we found our business model in the last place we looked, but it worked out, was what if we took two Palm Pilots and moved money between them? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that even that nobody wanted, but the idea of moving money on the internet was good enough. And so that, <laughs> but that one, uh, we literally knocked on every door and finally something happened. But actually, you, you happen to find an uh, investor, or, or even investors. Can you tell us more about how do you guys uh, secure your, uh, like the, the future of your company? So the original investor into PayPal was Peter Thiel, who was my then co-founder and CEO, although the exact dynamic was that I told him about my cryptography idea. He thought it was a really cool idea, and he immediately wanted to invest. And then it turned out that no one else wanted to invest. Peter was the only one who wanted to invest in that idea. And after a while, he realized that either I was very bad at, invest at gathering investors, or it was not a good idea, but it was too embarrassing for him to admit it was a bad idea. So he said he joined me as a co-founder. And then we looked for investors together, and still nobody cared. <laughs> and then eventually, we changed the, the plan over and over again until we finally chanced on this payments idea. And even then, nobody wanted to give us money. But uh, my uh, Interestingly enough, I'm going to a conference a couple of days in Finland, which will be my first time ever in Finland, even for 10 minutes. But the way we got our first round of funding for PayPal after, I think we pitched 150 investors, and everyone said no. And then in the last ditch effort, we pitched Nokia Ventures, which was the Nokia corporate arm venture investors, which was completely unknown, tiny little group of people in Silicon Valley, and it was led by a former Nokia corporate lawyer who was not a venture capitalist. And the combination, so use interesting factoid. So um, by then, it was not just two of us. It was four more people. And one of them was Peter's friend from school. But the other three my, were my classmates from University of Illinois, where I went to school. And uh, one of them was a Polish kid named Luke Nosek, who happened to be friends with another Polish kid who was helping the Nokia Ventures guy. So he said, all right, we've tried everything. We're going to lean on our Eastern European connections. And so Luke called this guy and said, hey, so we have a company. It's probably going to fail. But you're Polish. I'm Polish. We have to get together. <laughs> and we have a Ukrainian guy, so it's going to be OK. And so they showed up in our office, and they're like, oh my god, what are you working on? But we like you. And so uh, somehow we convinced them to give us our first check. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first investor in PayPal was Nokia Ventures. And uh, now they're known as Blue Run Ventures, and their big claim to fame, they discovered PayPal. They renamed themselves after a while. But uh, that, that was a, th there's no glory in our funding journey. There was no. Uh, <laughs> No, no amazing moment. Or I guess that was the amazing moment after 150 investors. And you became the CTO, the first CTO of the company. Yeah, I originally wanted to be the CEO. And then after a while, I realized that. So what happened? Um, 
I definitely didn't know anything about. So before PayPal, I started five other companies, or maybe four other companies, four or five other companies. It's been a long time, and they all failed, one after the other. Um, Do you know why? <laughs> I mean, certainly not the first three, because I would have done something different. <laughs> I think uh, I have a tendency, if I find a wall, I just sort of uh -huh. Bang be, it, beat my head against okay. it. Uh, but uh, they, they each failed for different reasons, but the umbrella reason was it's very hard to raise funding in rural Illinois in the middle of cornfields. <laughs> and, uh, that, that's where I went to school. You're very lucky to be in a metropolitan center and in a cool university. I was in a very cool university in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And so there was no funding available. It was also very early 90s, and the internet as an idea, or the, the web, the I mean, internet has been around for a long time, but the web was definitely not commonly known. And so people, one of my best funding pitches right before the company number three failed was with a venture capitalist in Chicago who said, you seem like a really smart kid. I don't understand anything you're saying. You should come and work for me. And I said, doing what? I, I was definitely not going to do it, but I was so curious. I asked him, what would I do? So well, maybe you can manage a parking lot for me. Oh. That, that was the best response I got for my venture capital pitch. And so, so raising money in, in Illinois in the middle of 90s was very difficult. Um, but I think the CEO to CTO transition was when I realized that my companies never failed because the technical ideas were bad. And the technical teams were very, very good. And so clearly that was not the problem. And so I should focus on technology and let somebody else do the business side. And so when Peter said, I'll join you for a while and help you raise money, it's like, mm, you should join me for a long while and run the company. <laughs> and so that, that's what happened. OK. Uh, how many Ukrainians are we uh, with us tonight? Can you guys raise a hand? OK, we have a couple of you know, people. OK. So this is a question for you guys. You said you. you uh, you have Ukrainian roots. You've been born in. I was born Ukraine. in Kiev. Uh, do you speak Ukrainian? Uh, I sp this is not the day to admit it, but I speak better Russian than I speak Ukrainian okay. because Kiev, when I was growing up there, was predominantly a Russian language city. So my Russian is fluent. My Ukrainian is fluent on the comprehension front, mm -hmm. but when I speak it, half the time it comes out in English. And so I actually I'm, I'm embarrassed to speak Ukrainian because. One out of every three words, I, I can't think of it. And my natural language of retreat is English. Mm -hmm. So I, if you want to speak to me in Ukrainian, speak slowly, and I'll understand you just fine. But uh, I don't practice either language very much other than English these days. OK. Uh, do you think that, uh, I mean, like, my question is like, uh, how the, the conflict in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, is seen from, uh, from US right now, especially from, from Silicon Valley? Uh, do you like, can I? You know, Give us some thoughts about it. Sure. Um, I think US is definitely very engaged. As, uh, I mean, obviously, at the government level, US Congress is constantly passing more aid. And there's a lot of debate in the security circles around what kind of weapons are OK, which ones are not OK. And so all of that is very, very front and center. I think the population is very aware of what's going on and cares a lot and thinks very poorly of Putin and his decisions and very positively of Ukraine and its fight for freedom. I think the, there's a couple of things that are maybe more nuanced than US public understands. I think the idea of ideas of conflict in Eastern Europe is seen through a very different lens. The mm -hmm. so US borders have not changed since Louisiana Purchase, yeah. and plus Hawaii, plus Alaska. Yeah. But <laughs> basically, the last time major change of the continental United States has taken place was in the 1800s. And so the idea of somebody comes over your border is incredible. Like if Canada decided to take part of Idaho, we would not be OK. And it, it would be extraordinary. And yet, the conversation around, well, Crimea was not always Ukrainian. It was for a while Russian. And before that, there was something else, too. I think a lot of people don't fully understand how is that possible. It 
I think that actually accretes to Ukraine because they see it, well, there was a border and Russians came over, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. But ha having a deep conversation, for example, when somebody says, well, you're from Ukraine, which languages do you speak? And so I speak Russian better than I speak Ukrainian. So that's crazy. Are you not a patriot? Like, I'm extremely patriotic in my connection to Ukraine. But that said, my dad is from Crimea and my mom is from Kiev. And both places spoke more Russian than Ukrainian when I was there. And these days, Kiev is very Ukrainian spoken and Crimea is still kind of Russian speaking primarily. And I think that is lost on a lot of people. Doesn't change their, their support for, uh, for Ukraine for sure. I think generally speaking, in my neighborhood, I live in San Francisco, probably on every city block, there's at least two Ukrainian flags flying like on people's windows and in front of people's houses. So it's very, very strongly supported. Okay. Uh, do you have, do, do you think that the technology can help to solve the problem? I mean, like... I'm not a geopolitical specialist, so I, you're, you're now asking me questions I'm not qualified to answer. I think the most interesting thing from the technology and the conflict that I don't know how to, how to reconcile, so we got very lucky. Um, we were thinking of opening an office in Poland, in Ukraine, and in Russia. And we never, never opened an office in Russia, so we never had to face the difficult decision of what do you do. So US government at some point said it's no longer okay to do business in Russia, everybody had to withdraw, which makes a lot of sense. But on the other hand, you're telling people whom you've been supporting, sorry, we're not going to help you anymore. That's not good for Russian people view of the world. They, they feel abandoned and that's not what you want to see happen. But we did not have to make that choice. So we were very happy. So we have folks that work for us in Ukraine and we obviously have a huge investment in Poland. We're very, very happy to continue investing and supporting both places, certainly here. I know a lot of people in Silicon Valley that were trying to reconcile. So on the one hand, we want to continue communicating and being in touch with our Russian team. On the other hand, we have to cut off all ties. I know people that said, we're going to withdraw from Russia, but we're going to pay engineers through the rest of the year mm -hmm. just to make sure they're okay. So I think there's a lot of human versus geopolitical tension that people had to deal with. And in the end, I'm very happy that I didn't have to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, we only had to support the, the, the good side or the, the right side of this conflict. I'm glad I didn't have to uh, make any choices. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about the buy now, pay later model. Uh, don't you think this is like supportive uh, consumerism? I mean, like the, uh, because, you know, it's like you, you actually tell, telling to, to, to your to clients, hey, buy these things. Don't worry about, you know, the, your, uh, your payment, your money right now. You can actually get the credit somehow, somehow like, do you think it's okay to, to support this kind of technology? So. I don't think we're telling them, don't worry about it. We're actually saying you have to be on time. Uh, so when we designed the product, we made a lot of very deliberate choices. One choice was we will not charge late fees. So if you're late, there are no fees. However, if you're late and you're not trying to become current, you cannot use the product. Mm -hmm. So it's very black and white. Okay. You're basically cut off until you're, you're current. Mm -hmm. and. I'm a big believer in ability to borrow as an access point for people. So when I came to the US, we had five people and $600. So it was not, not a lot of money. And very soon after, I went to university. And at the university, I immediately had to borrow tens of thousands of dollars. If I said, you know what, I don't want to borrow money. And by the way, in Eastern Europe, the general mode of thinking, at least when I was here, was borrowing is a bad idea. Yeah. Like lending is definitely a very bad idea because you're charging interest, that's awful. But even borrowing is sort of like, ah, it's not, you know, better, better live within your means. So if you are borrowing today to pay for a thing that you could have saved up for tomorrow, I agree with that. I think you should just wait, save, and, and pay for it. If you're borrowing for something that you could not ever save up enough, like a university education or a car or a house or many things that are just too expensive to save for, the only way you get access to them is you borrow money, which I think if done intelligently and without tricks is actually very positive. When we designed the products for a firm, the question that I asked myself very explicitly was, how can I design products where I am never motivated 
to do harm to the end borrower. It's the reason we don't charge late fees is exactly what I said in the very beginning. So if you go borrow money from a bank, they say, I would love to give you this money. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to be on time. However, if you're not on time, I will make more money yeah. because there'll be a fee. And I think that's a moral dilemma that's profoundly difficult. Even if you're the best bank in the world, you have all the right ideas in your head, one day your shareholders come to you and they say, how can you make more money? We want you to make more money. Say, one easy way, I can just not remind you of your payments because we have a contract that says that if you are late, I'll make more money. So maybe I'll just slow down my reminders a little bit, or maybe I'll change the terms when you don't see them so you owe me a little bit more. And so, terms of service. Right. So any form of moral pressure on the lender to make more money through basically letting the person fail or letting the person make mistakes, to me was ultimately a slippery slope. So when we designed the products, we basically said, we always want to benefit when the customer benefits, and we always want to be hurt when the customer is hurting. So if the person loses their job and they can't pay us back, the only consequence for us has to be we don't get money. Mm -hmm. Because then maybe we'll invent a way for them to get a job, or maybe we'll find a way to help them take longer. But under no circumstances should we make more money when someone is out of their ability to pay. Mm -hmm. And if you look at every design decision we've ever made, it's very clearly on that. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that we have never strayed from that. Like we've never charged one dollar of late fees. We've never done any of the term-changing tricks that banks do all the time. And so as a consequence, I think we are allowing people to engage in buying things that they want to buy, but we're not telling them, go over what you can pay us back. Mm -hmm. Because if we were to do that, we would literally be saying, let us make less money. And we, we are very much a capitalist, profit-oriented institution. We have built by design a system where if we push you to borrow more than you can handle, we will be hurt more than you will be. So I think I, I, I feel very good about our design decisions. Sometimes people ask me, why don't you charge more or charge late fees? And that, that's why. I, I never want to be on the other side of that question of maybe just this one time, I'll make a little bit more. It, do, it doesn't work for our core values. OK. Uh, nice t-shirt, by the way. Thank you. Uh, a firm Warsaw. That's my, that's my next question. Uh, you guys are uh, looking to hire in Poland. Uh, why? why? Why Poland? You said that you, 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 it was, you were thinking about the Russia and, uh, and Ukraine, uh, but why Poland? Because of... Uh... Poland is a, an interesting place. So, obviously, I'm Eastern European, and it's no secret that Eastern Europe still is a good arbitrage. High-quality brains, high-quality education, slightly less expensive. So that, that's, as, as, a, as an employer, it's important. Yeah. <laughs> Poland is a special place in the sense that it's always been Eastern and Western. Mm -hmm. It's the first country this side of the Ukrainian border where the characters are Latin, not Cyrillic. Yes. Um, people generally speak good English. The education system is very strong and exports talent and skills that are very broadly applicable outside of just the Eastern European ecosystem. And it's large enough where you can actually build teams of more than just engineers. You can have designers and product managers and marketers and analysts and business people. Mm -hmm. And so Poland was sp chosen specifically because we wanted to build a presence here beyond just an outsourced, inexpensive team. And like I spent the entire day today with our teams, and we're trying to hire not just engineers, but also product managers. My, my number one request today was, how can I get more product managers? And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be hiring product managers in Poland. That will be very hard. <laughs> um, it's, 
my, my number one request for all universities worldwide is create a product manager major. I've never been to a school, and I, I haven't checked, I don't actually know if this one is different, but I've never been to a university where somebody stood up and said, I'm a product management major. It's always, I'm an economics major or a philosophy major or a computer science major, but I plan to do product when I graduate. It's such a huge opening. Like There are no graduate degrees in product management that I'm aware of, which is shocking because it's such an important job. So we'll, we will hire whatever your, man, your major is and we'll train you to. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, unlike many companies, we centered in Poland with the idea of creating employees as opposed to contractors. So people who are fully compensated, not just with cash, but also equity, you know, a stock, stock participation in a firm. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, uh, we're definitely very committed to, to investing more and more in the country. And do you think it's, it's a good idea to uh, work for you or for any other entrepreneur? I mean, like, you understand my question, yeah, like, employee versus being entrepreneur. Um, so I, I have a standard answer to this question because I get asked that <laughs> once in a while, more than once in a while. Um, these days, there are actually, you can get a major in entrepreneurship. When I was in school, it was not a thing yet. But generally speaking, I feel that entrepreneurship is more of a calling. Like, I'm not sure it's genetic, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a thing that you know you have to do. Mm -hmm. Like, I started my first company because somebody told me, you should come help me. I'm starting a company, you're a good engineer, come help me out. So mm -hmm. I was still at university. And at the time, I thought I was going to be a PhD in computer science and a professor for the rest of my life. And by the time that, that company failed after 12 months, and at the end of that, I knew there's nothing else I'll ever do. Like I cannot do anything but start companies, and that's why I'm still kind doing of it. Kind addiction. It's an addiction. It's the only thing that gives me professional enjoyment. You know, that's the way. Whatever, whatever the diagnosis. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, I, I will keep doing this until I die in the saddle. But there's definitely a moment in time when you know you have to do it. If you're lucky you sort of get the same way I do, where you sort of chance into a startup very early on, you realize it's the only thing you want to do in your life. Plenty of people want to do it, but don't know if they're ready. The best approximation is you work for a startup, or at least for a company, it doesn't matter if it's tiny or well-funded, that feels like a startup. Like for example, like I was really just very happy, I mean, I'm jet lagged, so I'm a little bit woozy, but I spend the entire afternoon meeting with our Polish teams, one after the other, talking about work, but mostly just enjoying the fact that it's like a tiny little team, seven people in a room, you can have very honest conversations, sort of very to the point, no corporate speak, no, uh, and we, we have uh, almost 2,700 people, so it's not a small company anymore, but in, at least in our Polish team, and in many of our teams, in other parts, uh, including in California, you have still this feeling of it's a startup. Like somebody, anybody can text me mm -hmm. in the middle of the night and I will always answer. And if it's a hard problem, I'll try to help it. And if it's just somebody who wants to complain, I'm always happy to hear them out. And um, that's what startups are like. You have real engagement all the time from the CEO all the way down. And so if you're ready to start a company, you should do it immediately because it just gets harder as you get old. I used to need three hours of sleep, and then it turned into five, and then six, and... You and need a lot of coffee right now. You I, I drink more coffee than most people. But uh, it, you become, you, you have more things in life. You have kids. You have, to, yeah. you have yeah. children, you have spouses, you have responsibilities, you have talks you have to give. But when you're really young and there's nothing, you just work, and it's very enjoyable. If you're not quite ready, join a startup or join something that feels like a startup. And very quickly, it, it's not all amazing and beautiful. A lot of it is just really painful and difficult and you fail a lot and you fail over and over again. And at the end of each failure, you either go, I can't wait to do it again. Or you say, I've had enough. I need safety and security and just a sense of, I can go home and forget about work. One of the downsides and upsides of a startup, when I go home, it's not like my job stops. I can't just sort of 
don't worry about it, I'll think about it tomorrow morning. Like my phone is buzzing, that means somebody, something's going on at work and I have to answer. And so at a startup, you don't get to have the break that you get in any other context. But if you love what you do, you don't want a break. You actually you want to keep looking at your phone. And so you, you can find out what it's like when slightly less stressed working for a startup. But if you want to start one and you kind of feel ready, just do it. It's, e it's easier to fail when you're young. <laughs> uh, how do you select the co-founders in your companies? Do you have like secret sauce? Can you tell us just a little bit about it? Um, the most important thing is integrity. That I think over the years, I used to have a formula for 75% integrity, 20% IQ, 5% skills. And then at some point I said, ah, really smart people can learn anything. So maybe it's 75% integrity and 25% IQ. Then I thought, well, IQ is kind of overrated because some people are not necessarily geniuses, but they have really good leadership skills. They can get geniuses to do work for them. So maybe it's 80% integrity. And then at some point, like the only thing that matters if you have complete trust. Like if the person is, you feel that they will have your back 100% of the time, that's the most important thing. Like obviously, you don't want to start a company with someone who has no interest in your, your idea or doesn't have any skills at all or maybe just cannot speak or write. But ultimately, a lot of those things are worth a lot less than you think. They're, they're very tactical. Mm -hmm. The strategic thing of importance is, do you believe this person is 100% on your side all the time? It's, the, the, the biggest similarity is like getting married. Yeah, that's right. If you're, you're basically choosing a work spouse. And if a company is successful, it might be a decade-long work spouse, or, or maybe even longer. And so and the other sort of piece of unsolicited advice, it is really hard to do alone. So it, it's very, very bad. It's better to do it alone than with a wrong co-founder. Mm -hmm. But it is very hard to do it on your own. Do, do you believe that actually can be successful doing this business alone? It depends on what kind of support system you have. So a firm was co-founded by four people, but one by one they each left to do something else, mm -hmm. and I'm the only one left. And uh, I happen to be very lucky. I met my wife first year of PayPal, and she was basically very early there and seen the entire journey and every time I, and a firm is several other projects after paypal so there, there were others in the middle that slide. our slide was one we, we don't talk about slides so much <laughs> <laughs> i mean it was good financially it was not not nearly i was not nearly as committed to it uh emotionally but the, the there are many other projects too and my wife has seen me through all of those, including the most important, the most valuable thing a co-founder can do for you is to tell you the truth, even if, when it's not nice. Mm -hmm. And so when I was working on Slide, my wife sat me down and said, you're working on a company you don't care about. Oh. And you're not going to like hearing this. You're not going to enjoy this conversation. But I can tell you, you are working on something for the last seven years that you are never going to feel great about. You should do something about that. And in the moment, I was so mad at her. And the reason I say, tell the story now is because if anybody ever meets my wife, you should tell her that I continuously thank her. I'm so stubborn, I would have worked for another seven years on it before giving up. And instead, I got a chance to sell that and start a firm, which I'm very passionate about and will continue to work on for as long as they'll have me. Uh, what, what do you think? Oh, uh What's the role of the CEO? What is the role of CEO right now, from your perspective? Do you think he's like much more like a person who is uh, telling people what to do or is inspiring, uh, especially when you, you, you're dealing with the Generation Z? What's, what's your thought about it? One useful truth about being a CEO of any size company, you can never tell people what to do. It doesn't, doesn't actually work. Mm -hmm. And anybody who thinks that they can tell people what to do is kidding themselves. You can sometimes tell people what you would like them to do, and they can tell you to go to help, or they can tell you, that's amazing, let's do it together. But those are the only two choices. So you have to inspire them. Inspire, lead, show, co-conspire, 
th there's many different ways to create output, mm -hmm. but even if in the moment I can tell someone, do what I say, what's in their head is, just you wait until I slam the door in your face. And sometimes you can say, look, trust me, do what I say because I think I have the right idea and we disagree, but it's my job to make a decision. Mm -hmm. That's the closest thing you can come to, come to as a CEO or as a manager to tell someone what to do. But ultimately, it's a credibility game. Mm -hmm. If you say, look, I'm gonna, I need you to do this for me, with me, please trust me. If you're wrong a few times, they'll say, why should I trust you? You made mistakes over and over again. If you're a great leader, you don't need to say, trust me. You say, look, we're doing this. I may be wrong. Like, I may be leading you in the wrong place. But if I am wrong, we'll get out of it together. Like, we will, we will find a way. And so you inspire is, or lead is, is a better choice of, of action and words than tell people what to do. Traditionally, I used to say this all the time. I think it's still true even now for me, but the three jobs every CEO has in a startup for sure is have a vision, mm -hmm. like where are you actually gonna go, bring together the best team, mm -hmm. and make sure you don't run out of money. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Very, very simple, but you think it's, uh, th this is the best recipe for the startup? I mean like, because everyone is sitting here can, can think, okay, so next day I'll uh, like launch something, uh, you know, Max told me that it's only three things I should care about. But I think it's like, well, maybe just a little bit um, uh, things uh, to, to do as a, as a CEO. It depends on how good your team is. Mm -hmm. So for example, so if I started a company without technical co-founders, I could say I'm gonna choose the programming language and the, whether it's on-premise or cloud and what frameworks we use mm -hmm. and whether it's microservices or a monolith, there's all these decisions, or you can have the best CTO who's better than me. They can say, I'm not gonna choose any of those choices. You decide. I will just make sure we don't run out of money. And so a, a great team allows you to delegate majority of the really difficult decisions. In a startup, if you have very little money and you're trying not to run out, very often a CEO is also the COO and the head of sales and the CTO, and you, you get to do a lot of roles. Over time, if you're doing the right things, more and more of it is just saying, we're, we're all going over there. The mm -hmm. goal is at the end of that road, we're all going in the right direction together. I will make sure that the team around us is the best team we can possibly gather and raise money until we're profitable so that we don't run out. So I, I think it's actually a pretty close to perfect formula. Reality is though, at two o'clock in the morning, any given night, you can find me telling people, I hate this word in this marketing message, please change it. <laughs> so I don't necessarily practice all of my advice. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's, let's get back to, to uh, reality and the recession and inflation uh, are becoming very tough around the world. E-commerce based businesses, so which you guys are doing with, uh, are feeling the, the, the very serious effect of the economic downturn. Uh, what plans do you have at FRM uh, to weather this period? I mean, like, this, is, this, is, this looks very bad. So I think that is actually where we get to fulfill our mission. So as inflation goes up and the central banks raise interest rates, mm -hmm. you will see more jobs lost. So people will get laid off and will have to make do more than they used to. But even if they keep their jobs and have some stability, it just costs more to buy the things they yeah. need. When, during the pandemic, the demand for our service quadrupled overnight, mm -hmm. mostly because people were trying to buy everything they needed for their home. So it was a little bit crazy. But our job is to help people afford things responsibly without late fees, without all the garbage. And so I feel like the need for a firm will increase doesn't make it easier for us to navigate the, the, the challenges, but generally speaking, if you're in a business that more people need in a difficult time, you have better odds of survival than if you're in a business where people don't need it anymore. For example, if you're selling luxury watches, 
I would be very scared right now because during a downturn, fewer people need luxury watches. Yeah. If you are helping people afford couches and shirts and education, you're probably okay. Um, I sort of prefer when it's harder for two reasons. Mm -hmm. I think if you're not mentally prepared, it's easier to give up. I, I feel that I am, having failed at many, many startups, and I, I'm old enough where I've lived through three or four recessions in the US, so I kind of know that there's a rainbow at the end. But if you're just entering the first one, it's scary. So I'm hopeful that some of my competitors will say, all right, never mind, I had we enough. We give up. Give up. So I, I know yeah. we don't give up. Um, and so I think it'll be a little bit easier to compete. And two, the way you deal with challenging times, you constrain the things you do. You essentially say, we have limits. Maybe last year I wanted to hire a thousand more engineers. Now I should be a little bit more careful and hire somewhat fewer engineers. That means I get to build fewer projects and I better choose the really, really good ones. And so difficulty and downturn forces you to be very focused. And that's good. Like the, my biggest challenge as a CEO and product designer, I've never found a product I didn't want to build. I come up with ideas, and the first thing I want to do is like, what I need is 10 more engineers, and we'll have that too. And so in a constrained environment where every engineer matters, and we only have to work on the really, really important projects, it's a forcing function for me to decide what really matters and what can wait a half a year. And so we'll, I'm sure we'll build everything, <laughs> but not, not all at once. <laughs> OK. Uh, you guys have offices in San Francisco, right? In Warsaw? Uh, so you're a global company. I mean, like you San Francisco, San Francisco, Toronto, Chicago, New York, Warsaw, soon London, um, Pittsburgh. Okay. okay. Many I, of I think that's it. Many people working there. What's your thoughts on remote work? Oh, um, <laughs> so as a CEO. <laughs> So when we had to go remote in uh, April of 2020, my wife told me, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. So she's very social. She loves people. She loves hosting friends. She wants to see her friends. She wants to go out. And I am not. And so uh, the first day of the pandemic, I had six monitors in my desk and a lock on my door. I told my kids, please don't disturb me. She like, Daddy's working. <laughs> like, Daddy's working? See you later. <laughs> so my wife said, you're living your best life and I'm miserable. <laughs> like, and like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of hoping this doesn't end very soon because uh, this is great. So and, it, was, it was your fault. <laughs> well, I was very happy about it. And then after a while, I started missing the spark of conversation with real people. Mm -hmm. I thought, ah, maybe I'm just not, you know, I'm too old, I need to get used to Zoom, and it's going to be okay. And then I had my first executive gathering. It, the pandemic was still going on. Like, we just had our first vaccine, mm -hmm. and we finally got together. And actually, one person was positive, which was very scary, and now nobody cares. <laughs> but at the time, we're like, oh my god, we all have to, I don't know, go quarantine ourselves in a, in a room somewhere. But even with that sort of scary moment, like, this is the best ever. I missed just talking to people about product ideas in the same room with a whiteboard and like having a meal together and drinking a glass of wine and talking about what it's going to be 10 years from now. And that was my first kind of like, huh, maybe I don't love the stuck behind my six monitors quite as much as I thought I would. And as we sort of got back to more and more normal, I don't think it's possible for us to go back to everybody in the same room ever. Like when we were just about to go into lockdown in San Francisco, we had 800 people in one office in San Francisco, basically. And now we have fewer than 200 people in San Francisco because lots of people during the pandemic said, 
I can work from a screen, yeah. so it's expensive to live in San Francisco. Maybe I don't even like it. I'll move to Austin. I'll move to Seattle. I'll move to Denver. We don't have an office in Seattle. We don't have an office in Denver. We have 100 people almost in Seattle. We do not have a shared place there at all. Like it's a WeWork, mm -hmm. just an, a mind space like space that we have in Warsaw. And I don't think we can ever say, all right, everybody has to come back together and come into the office five days a week. But what we can do is create opportunities for people to come together. So we've been doing a ton of gatherings. So our San Francisco office on any given day has two or three team meetings where at least half the people are not from San Francisco. They're flying in from all over the place. And I think, I don't think we're done figuring out the exact mode, but I think the idea of partially together, partially remote, is here to stay, at least for us. Mm -hmm. I think my friend Elon believes that the only way to work is to uh, do long hours in person. I didn't want to ask you about Elon, but OK. Thank you for bringing this <laughs> subject. <laughs> He's a friend. We don't agree on everything. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, my last question. After so much success, what motivates you to, to keep building a firm? I mean, like. You can be, you know, spending your time on the beach, you know, having your drink. Why going again and, you know, establishing the uh, uh, a startup? You know, going all the for all the pain again. What motivates you? I like the pain. Is that is okay. that the, uh, the honest <laughs> answer? Um, I think entrepreneurs entrepreneurship is similar to having a baby, when you just, you just had a baby, the baby does not care about you. It can barely orient itself. It wants to eat and it's screaming all the time. And you sort of think like, what have I done? This, this is not what I signed up for. I thought it was going to be cute and mm -hmm. smile a lot. This is and, my and love me. But I'll go back. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, can I, you know, may, maybe. And after about a year with babies and with startups, it starts to take shape and you have this incredible experience where you get more than you put in. You teach it things, and it makes all kinds of interesting things of its own. And after two years, it starts talking or maybe making money. And then after five years, it's really impactful, and you feel like you've changed the world, or at least you, you created one life that's really making a difference. And you kind of go through life where you feel like you've created something out of nothing, like it didn't exist, and now it's suddenly really relevant and amazing. Except with babies, so I now have a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old, and my 13-year-old is kind of a wuss, so he still wants his papa and wants to sort of, you know, he, he really needs me. But my 11-year-old daughter will move out the day she's allowed to, and will probably, she's done, she's figured it all out, she knows all the answers, and she doesn't need me. And I'm too old to have more kids but I'm never too old to have more startups. And so the experience <laughs> of taking something that didn't exist and struggling with it and hating myself for it, like why did I sign up for the pain? And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really similar. It's the all-nighters and the, uh, the screaming child or the, yeah. s the startup that doesn't make sense, doesn't work. If it makes it, you have this amazing sense of uh, being relevant. The most important thing entrepreneurs need, the, the, the drug that we want, it's not the pain, it's the sense of relevance. Like there are people out there that depend on your product. And employees or co-founders that depend on your ideas, on, as a CEO, your ability to raise money, your ability to find the right team. But this notion of, I am relevant to someone. If I disappeared tomorrow, the world would notice, mm -hmm. is very deeply human need. You want to feel relevant. And with kids, you get that once per kid, yeah. and by in my case, 11 years old, she does mm -hmm. not care. Okay. With startups, you can have 100. So uh, I'd rather have startups are my children. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've done with my questions. Uh, it's now time for your question, guys. So, yeah, you, sir. So what kind of pitch would make you want to mentor someone? And what kind of values would you be looking for in a person like that? Um, I'll repeat the question, assuming if ever, everybody heard in the back. Oh, cool. The acoustics in this room are good. No, normally, you have to repeat the question because the people in the back cannot hear it. Um, so 
if I'm completely honest, I am so busy these days, mentorship is very hard. I'm good at, at asynchronous communication. So if you want to contact me, M. Lefchin, first initial, last name, at affirm.com. Full disclosure, it goes to Brooks first, <laughs> which means that it's his value filter and your ideas are safe with him. But the flip side is that he runs a firm investing arm. So if it's a really good business idea, he will not only pass it on to me, he'll also invest in it. So, so it's a good trade. Um, in my opinion, mentorship is overrated. Oh. But not in the same way as like don't, you know, I, I think mentorship can be summarized in five or 10 really good pieces of advice given at the very right time. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need your professors in a university to hold your hand every day helping you with your homework. That, that happened in middle school or in high school. Yeah. By the time you get to, to a real school like a university, you're doing it on your own, but you need someone who has seen it all before to say that one, that's not quite right, do that. And so a great mentor isn't someone who meets with you every month and helps you, you know, pushes you forward. That should have happened a long time ago. That no one can help you now. But if you're working on something really interesting and important and you have a question, a good mentor or somebody can say, oh, in my head, the answer to that question is this, not that. And that's kind of all you need. If the question is interesting, Brooks will send it to me. Um, or if you're fond of puzzles, you can guess my email address. <laughs> That's one way. I eventually respond to all good questions, but sometimes eventually takes a long time. Okay, another question. Yep, the guy in the white shirt. Yep. I would have a question um, about like generally life. Do you feel safe? Uh, uh, <laughs> Should I not? That's a tricky question. Okay. <laughs> Brooks? <laughs> um, if necessary, Brooks will tackle you later. <laughs> uh, he's very tall and, and, and works out every day. Um, I think I live in the happy medium of only being known to nerds. And so uh, I am not afraid of nerds tackling me or kidnapping me or, or doing terrible things to me. M maybe that's naive, but uh, I think uh, I, I enjoy my quasi stardom where I'm more likely to be stopped in the street with a, I have an idea, please listen to my business pitch, or I have a computer science question, what do you think? <laughs> Those are not scary. The, I would like to, uh, Take your coat or your wallet doesn't happen to me, and uh, hopefully it will not. <laughs> for, okay. the, for the moment, I feel safe. Yes. Yo. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about the importance of integrity between founders. Uh, does this also apply to investors? How yes. much trust should I have for them to accept funding from them? Because it is hard to, even to get a funding. As you said, you, you, you talked about like 150 investors. Uh, and didn't get it, but if I have this opportunity, should I, uh, should that, I look that, for the, for the value? Yeah? That, that's a great question, yeah. and the short answer is yes. It's really, really important. Like, it's actually equally important. I mean, think of, uh, to take my sort of marriage analogy one step further, basically, it's like the parents of your spouse. If you think that uh, you're marrying into a terrible family, you may be making a mistake, unless you're planning to run away with your spouse and never see the parents again. But with investors, you have to see them a lot. The reason for it is there are only two real outcomes in a startup environment. Great success, and everyone's happy, and all the other outcomes, which are basically not good. And so if it's, it's working, but the investors don't like you, or it's working, but you need more money, or it's not working, and you want to do something else, or it's working okay and you want to change everything. Every one of those decisions requires you to have a very honest, very, very real conversation with your investors. If you don't trust them to begin with, 
it's never going to happen and the company will fail. If you do trust them and you're wrong and they don't actually have integrity, it's even worse. You will tell them your innermost secret or your half-formed plan and they might take advantage of you. So you're, it's as important to have faith that your investors have your best interest. One of the things that we were very, very lucky, so the Nokia Venture guys, Nokia Ventures guys, when funded PayPal, they were extraordinarily high integrity. And of course, when we just met them, all we knew is they had some Eastern European roots and so they were more like us than not. But in retrospect, we got so incredibly lucky where the very first board dinner, not even a board meeting, literally two weeks after Nokia Ventures invested, Peter and I sat down with the two people from there and said, so this whole idea of uh, cryptographic exchange using Palm Pilots, we think we're going to change that plan. It's not working. And we fully expected them to say, give us back our money. And instead, they were like, oh, we thought we'd get one glass of wine. It looks like we need a bottle. Tell us more. <laughs> Which I was like, OK, we're going to be OK. These guys are on our side. And th by the way, th there's a very easy way of verifying the answer to what, the, what that future looks like. When they're investing in your company, if they're fixated on the business and the technology and the product and all those things, that's not the right fixation. The right fixation is you. What they're doing is they're asking themselves, are you honest? How good is your integrity? Is your co-founder honest? Do you have a real relationship? Are you really, really good people? If you change your plans and you're smart and you're really good people, they'll make money. If you're not good people, it doesn't matter how smart you are, doesn't matter how good your idea is, if something goes wrong, everybody runs away. And so they're testing you for the same thing you're testing them. And you'll know very quickly if they're really probing on, do you have high integrity? That's the best predictor of them having high integrity. OK, maybe from this part of, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll try to give shorter answers. I, I always do this where I give long answers and then not enough people have a chance. That's OK. okay quick question. Um, you're mentioning that you are focusing on uh, funding, on vision, and the mentoring, yes? So why do you need six monitors? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really bad at switching windows, so I just want no. Um, I think the biggest reason was uh, I just never had a setup with six monitors and I thought it would be really cool. <laughs> I really only use three now. <laughs> it sounds a bit like a trading setup or something. I, I, have n I have never traded. I don't plan to. Um, initially, my idea, when I just started the pandemic, I had this really bad idea that I, I would be on Zoom basically 24 hours a day. So that we were all very scared. Like when you, I mean, it's my first pandemic. I don't know everybody, everybody else, but I have never lived through a pandemic. I thought maybe, I mean, I read a lot of science fiction as a kid. And so uh, there's a great novella called The Machine Stops. I don't know if anybody's read it. E.M. Forster. It's from 1914. It's probably the best prediction of the uh, 2020 pandemic you can possibly imagine. Highly recommend it. I'm sure it's translated into every language because it's very old. But in it, just people live in tiny little cells underground and communicate through some magic technology where they can kind of see each other and they never come out. They, they all live alone. And I thought maybe we have lived, we're now living in the world of the machine stops. I will never leave my room. And so I thought, well, the one way of fixing that, I will have a giant monitor, maybe two, where anyone from a firm who wants to log in and see me, they can just see me because I'll always be there on camera. After about two days of that, I decided I could not handle it anymore. <laughs> and so that stopped. So I, I didn't need two of those monitors. Um, I like having a monitor where I can see Slack or something like Slack, where I can just see real-time chat from the teams. And then I spent a lot of my time writing. And so having a no distraction screen filled with whatever it is I'm writing is very valuable. So that's two screens and then a third one for everything else. So I, I use three now. OK. Uh, yes? So could you tell about some tough technological decisions that you had to make, especially as a CTO of PayPal, for example? Sorry, I'm not tracking the question. Could you tell about some oh, tough technological decisions that you had to make as a CTO of PayPal? 
Um, the best known technology decision in the history of PayPal was when X.com, Elon's company, and PayPal, my company, and Peter's merged. Elon built his on Windows, and I built mine on Unix. And uh, we literally arm wrestled over uh, which technology would be the technology for the entire company. You can imagine that I lost. I'm, I'm a uh, relatively uh, tiny Ukrainian versus a giant South African Elon. Uh, however, I still won because we built PayPal on Unix. But uh, that, that was probably the biggest choice. Um, at a firm, we made lots of interesting decisions. One of them was um, we chose to build our apps primarily natively, although everyone was doing React Native at the time because faster to develop and essentially a web view with just slightly more, slightly faster rendering speed. And we thought that we would benefit from, I mean, it's already difficult to build applications to do financial services in real time because you're constantly going out to dozens of external services. And so if the user interface is not as fast as it possibly can be, you're just going to pay a penalty in consumer adoption. So we chose to do separate Android and iOS development, which at the time was controversial. These days, it's probably a little bit less so. Um, we originally built a firm entirely as a monolith, so a single deploy, which is very fast to deploy when you're tiny. And then fast forward 10 years, and you have a giant pile of code that you have to unit test every time you deploy. You have to go to microservices. But it's not like you can just easily peel apart everything. And so the gradual process to go to more and more hybrid, partial monolith, partial microservices type architecture, I think tactically, we may have made better decisions. But I think those were generally the right calls in both directions. Um, at PayPal, we chose C++ as a programming language, which was the dumbest idea ever. But it was also, it, in retrospect, it's a terrible programming framework. It's a beautiful language, but the actual implementation in 1990s was awful on Unix, doubly so. And yet, it was the language we all studied at the university. And so when we started the company, we had 12, 15 engineers that all came from the same class at the same university in the same year. All of us just passed. C++ exams. Of course, we chose the one language. When we started a firm, I decided that I will go with my favorite programming language, which at the time was Python. Probably still is. And so I, I picked Ooh. this time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like, I'm sure I'm pissing off Ruby fanatics in the audience. <laughs> but uh, I, I feel like uh, I once witnessed a debate between uh, Guido Van Rossum and Larry Wall, who designed Perl. And uh, I walked out of the room thinking, there's only one programming language that I will ever write any code in. And that was definitely not Perl. <laughs> and uh, so um, I know enough Ruby to be dangerous. And I still don't, don't prefer it at all over Python. It comes with batteries included and everything. OK, from the back, yes, you. running the company and then of course family traveling between different offices my first question is how do you manage your time because as a student I find it quite hard <laughs> and my second question is if you do find free time how do you like to spend it and do you still find yourself like working on personal coding projects or is it more like CEO work based so I'll answer backwards for a while I was terrified that I would lose my skills as an engineer. And finally, my now 13-year-old, so for a long time, he was refusing to learn programming because he thought it was, he, no, no kid wants to compare to their parents in the thing that the parent is good at. And I'm not sure I'm good at programming anymore, but I used to be pretty good. And he knows the history, so he basically said, I, I don't want to learn programming because I'll just be a, a second fiddle to your. And then one day, he got the bug. And then he no longer cared whether he's good or bad. He just wanted to program. And so now I have programming projects with my son, which is amazing. And what used to be like, hey, could you please give it a try is now like, all right, I really can't code with you tonight because I have some work stuff I have to do, <laughs> which is really great. Um, the interesting th so when I was a student, I was always late on my homework. I was always 
15 minutes late to every lecture and managing time was the worst thing in the world. It turned out that as I got older, it became harder to manage my time, but also became so necessary that I just kind of learned how to live within constraints. So I wouldn't be too concerned. As a student, it's your job to be late on your homework and be a mess and uh, stay up too late and then have a hard time waking up for the next lecture. Life will uh, knock sense into you whether you like it or not, so you might as well, uh, might, might as well enjoy it while it lasts. Um, in terms of fun, I found that if I don't have some physical activity, some kind of a sport, basically every day, I am not as creative. And so I found, so I, I was always a very bad, I was terrible at sports. So have, growing up in this part of the world, you're supposed to play football and hockey and you know something like that. And I couldn't play hockey to save my life. And when I moved to the United States, it was the greatest gift because no one was good at football at the time. And so I was suddenly, I was the worst player when I was in Kiev, but I was suddenly not so bad because people around me were terrible. And then of course, football or soccer became very popular in America in the last 10 years. And now it turns out that I am still terrible. But between then and now, I learned how to ride a bike really fast. And so I try to ride my bike pretty much every day. If Indoor? I'll do indoor, outdoor, any, anything I can pedal, I will pedal. All right. Except in a hotel gym, it's very hard because the bikes that they have in hotel gyms are typically so bad, it's actually just too painful to, to do it. But uh, I'm, I am very, very active in my cycling efforts. And so long as I have the time, it, every, every weekend I will disappear from my family for six or seven hours if I can help it. Just somewhere in the mountains on the bike. That, that keeps me sane. That also forces me to be very productive when I get home because my wife has just about had it. So. Okay. Yes. Um, Maxim, I have one question. So you mentioned that you've been hailing one company after another. So how were your parents about this and your girlfriend? <laughs> um, my girlfriend in college which I was 100% sure I was going to marry. I lived with her, we were you know, definitely on that track. Basically broke up with me because one night when I was doing another all-nighter in my, so my, my first three companies were at my university town. So after I graduated, I just kind of stuck around and I, I already had companies during school that I finally graduated and I just couldn't afford to go anywhere. So I just stayed in, central Illinois where it's cheap and had companies there that are also failing. And one day she called me and said, are we dating or not? And said, we're dating. She said, well, why are you in the office and I'm home alone? I said, I just need one more all-nighter. And, and she said, and then what? I said, I don't know. I think maybe this company will not fail. And she said, I've had enough. This, 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 this cannot be. And so by the time I got there the next morning, all my stuff was outside. So fair warning. <laughs> There's a real trade-off. Rom romantic relationships and early stage startups. There's some zero sumness to it. <laughs> that said, my now wife was my girlfriend all through PayPal. And the only trouble I got into with her was when she'd said, you're not working, which I respect, and you're not with me, which I insist on, you're doing something else. And if that something else is more important than me, I should know. And pretty quickly I realized that that's the one I definitely want to marry. And I learned to optimize my time. If it's not work, then it's with her. And everything else was maybe slightly more secondary. So it is definitely possible to have a romantic relationship in startups. You just have to know exactly what your priorities are. And have a girlfriend, boyfriend who's understanding enough to know that Sometimes startups consume 110% and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, my parents were terrified and uh, my grandmother had two PhDs. My parents all had masters or better. I was the first person in my family to suggest that maybe I should drop out of school. And uh, my entire academic family sat me down and had an intervention where they said, look, whatever you do, you must have a, 
at least one degree. After that, do whatever you want. So my, my grandmother with the two PhDs was literally on her deathbed and she said, look, I'm already dying. If you want to kill me sooner, you, you can drop out of school. <laughs> so I promised that I will not drop out of school, but I think I told her that I will consider getting a master's and I lasted one day in the master's program. <laughs> but I did get a bachelor's, so uh, grandma, I, I delivered on my promise. Uh, my parents were very scared. The funny thing is that the day we took PayPal public and I was suddenly no longer extremely poor, I was about to be extremely rich, I called my parents and said, hey, good news, I can buy you a house and I am not going to go broke, I think we're okay, and the first phrase from my mom's mouth was, that is the best news ever. You can finally move back to Chicago and get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> now, the funny thing is that she still says this to me now. <laughs> I just saw her last week and she said, so uh, you're very successful, but you know, no PhD. <laughs> okay, another question. More. Yes, you. Uh, how do you decide to choose on the first launch of the product? Uh, so, for example, like uh, we might have a product that can be launched to the market with uh, the basic functionalities, but in the back of your mind, you know, like uh, there are like, some features. If we had more time, we can actually. That that's an easy one. You should always launch. <laughs> It, it's a heuristic in a sense that I, I know the struggle. Like I've had this exact conversation with myself over and over and over in my own head. 100% of the time when you launch, two things happen. So true story, when we launched a firm, so we were lending money on day zero. We never pivoted, same exact company, same exact concept. So I was the principal backer of the company. I had success from PayPal. So I said, I will fund it and I will fund all the loans myself until we have product market fit. So until we launched, I was like, no problem. The day we were about to launch, we, so we sat around and built more features and did this and did that, and finally, I think we're ready. I said, oh my God, what if tomorrow everyone borrows everything that I committed to this company and no one ever pays us back? What am I gonna do then? Two things happened. All the features I thought were very important were not very important, and no one borrowed any money at all <laughs> for two years. <laughs> So whatever you think you know about your product, you don't until real people actually try it. Overwhelmingly likely, when they try it, they will not like it. It's possible some will, and they will tell you, if you did more of that, we would like it better. And that's the best thing you can possibly get. The feedback from your users telling you, do this, not that, is more valuable than anything. So people tell you, stupid product, I don't like it, wrong colors, bad logo, features missing, doesn't matter. Like, you know that to be true already. What do you want is a little bit of positive feedback. Somebody telling you, I would use that if, or I'm using this for that purpose. That is so much more valuable than anything you can build in a vacuum. Just if you have something that you think is interesting enough or useful enough, launch it and see what happens. And by the way, if the worry is, what if competitors steal my idea? Lots of people are working on exactly the same idea in the world right now. So you're never working on the same, on the one true unique thing alone that just doesn't exist. Everyone knows how to code. Everyone has access to the internet. Every idea is just a rehash of an old idea. We did not invent borrowing. We did not invent, you know, I claim to be the grandfather of buy now, pay later. And of course, buy now, buy now pay later was invented in the mid 1500s. So no idea is brand new. Your version of your idea with feedback from real users is what's going to make you more defensible. So just launch yesterday. Okay, next question, maybe from the back, but please, uh, yes, just wait for the mic. If you ask simpler questions, I will give shorter answers. <laughs> That's the challenge. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so uh, my question is actually a little bit more uh, technical one, not exactly, but uh, something like that. Uh, so where do you think the future of software development uh, lies? Because we're hearing a lot, of, uh, a lot about uh, local solutions, about artificial intelligence, data science. So where do you think we should be going, where we will, where we will go, maybe something like that? That's a worth separate multiple hours worth of conversation. The short answer is I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I was stunned by how rapidly 
generative AI went from being a cute trick to being very, very successful. So if I were doing nothing with my time, I would be spending all my time learning more about GPT and trying to explore what algorithms like generative the generative take on neural networks is, is, is the sort of the broadest area I would spend my time in. That said, there's lots of people working on it already. If you're trying to find something really different and really cool and new, just at least I found that most interesting ideas come from theory, not practice. So I would spend more time reading abstract computer science books, looking for new interesting challenges versus looking at products. Products are always the last thing in the chain the first thing in the chain is some really abstract idea that gives you inspiration. That's probably the best I can do on short notice. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's. Okay. Yeah. So we first uh, but, but wait for the microphone. <laughs> but wait for the microphone. That's a good way to bargain. Yes. Uh, let me see the questions. Yeah, go first. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, look, first of all, our firm was helping over here as a company to Ukrainians within the Ukrainian crisis. On every single level, the people were uniting. I know that you were donating yourself uh, a lot to support the refugees over here. And during this conversation, you mentioned the purpose. And it seems like a firm is a purpose-driven company. The question is, like maybe following up on, on, on the previous topic, how do you find the purpose worth fighting dying and staying overnight to uh, build a company, of course. <laughs> I think life is sacred. Dying, actually dying is a, uh, is a bad idea. I recommend against it. Um, I think ultimately purpose is something you already know. It, it's different for everybody. I think for me, 25 years ago, I was very embarrassed because I just took a company public, and yet right in front of my girlfriend, somebody denied me credit because they said, your credit score is so bad, I don't care who you are, you cannot borrow money. And my skin turned purple, and I thought one day, I am going to take this embarrassment and turn it into a product and spare the rest of people that I know and don't know. Borrowing should not be so ugly. I should not feel embarrassed or ashamed of having access to capital. I was trying to buy a car, which doesn't matter how wealthy you are, it's a smart idea to pay for it over time. And uh, it was enough of a seed in my brain. The more I learned about credit, the more I learned about borrowing, the more I decided it's not just me and my stupid little moment trying to buy a nice car. It's actually a much bigger problem. The industry is built around this notion that if you lose, they will win. And I think that's wrong and broken and should be fixed. Entrepreneurship is about deciding that no matter how big the problem is, you are strong enough to fix it. And that the, the, the real trade is always, I'm going to try. Odds are pretty good I'll fail. But I'm not afraid. And if I do win, or if I do succeed, the problem is so big, it's worth fighting for. I think, more often than not, it's very hard to find the trade-off if the problem is not something you've personally experienced. You can believe in it in the moment. But if it becomes more difficult, if it's not your personal experience, you start questioning whether you're fighting for the thing that's possible to win. I think it's easy to support Ukrainian refugees because I was once a Ukrainian refugee. It's easy to support fighting against bad credit practices because I once got punched in the face more than once because I was an immigrant with no credit. And so it's always very personal. I think uh, if you need a list of areas that matter, it's easy to make. Energy, food, water, access to capital, access to shelter, basic human needs. There's always something somewhere that really makes a difference to a very large group of people. But if it's not your personal struggle, or at least not your past personal struggle, be prepared for that moment where you ask yourself, it's not my struggle. Why am I fighting so hard? So it's easy to fight for something that you personally experienced. 
Okay. I got a microphone, so I start. Okay, so <laughs> the last question. Nice. Last question. Last Please. question, really quick one, thanks. Uh, as a CEO of a publicly traded company, what do you see, uh, which pressure do you see more from the investors these days? A pressure on growth or a pressure on profitability? That's a great question. Very, uh, very astute of you as an observer of publicly traded companies. Um, the short answer is both. I literally had a call with an investor who said, I don't, so, for a lender, for a financial services company, it's even more complicated than just growth and profitability because you can, if you raise prices, you can have more credit losses because you're compensated for the risk. So you can grow and you just raise prices a little bit. If you're transparent, I don't have a moral issue raising prices if I honestly tell you what the cost will be. but. If you are willing to take on more credit losses, the investors don't know if you're doing this because you choose to do so or because you can't stop it. And so you have to grow, you have to be profitable, and you can't lose too much money to credit losses because then you're signaling that you're not in control. So the pressure I feel is on all three of those dimensions, not just the two that you mentioned. But I think that's why, and it's a little perverse, but it's good for people with capacity to compete, to have a more difficult environment like we have today, I am not worried about being able to meet any of those challenges. I think a lot of my competitors are, and that's good. I, I want them to quit. OK. That was the last question. Sorry, we, we <laughs> ran out of time. So thank you, thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, Max Levchin, CEO of our firm. Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs>